that wall and had to fall Cause there is a sound that makes walls fall down There is a sound that makes walls fall down There is a sound that makes walls fall down Release the sound
Try that. Okay, it's on. Good morning, everyone. Praise the Lord. Why don't we just read our scripture and then you can sit down. If you don't mind standing just for a moment, we want to read from Luke 7. We're going to read one verse. Luke 7, 47. In Jesus' name. Wherefore, I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Praise God. Let's pray just for a second in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for the word of God. We thank you, God, that you care enough for us to talk to us. We ask, oh God, that you would speak to every one of us this morning in this place for your name's sake and for our soul's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Amen. We've started a new series, and we have a new devotional guide for the spring. You should have seen it in the vestibule if you didn't know what that was all about. Uh, we're starting a new series um, of God's Word for Life. The uh, children's devotional is there as well, and this is the adult uh, booklet. Uh, the three topics in our spring devotional guide are parables of kingdom truths, Portraits of Salvation, and God, our Judge and King. Amen. And so our first series from that is the Parables of Kingdom Truths, and we're beginning that this morning. Jesus taught some of his best lessons through parables and stories, and they always had a spiritual application. And our series will take a look at four of those parables, uh, the two debtors this morning, then the talents, the prodigal son, and the rich man and Lazarus. As we look into these sacred stories, we'll see the amazing love of God coupled with his unblemished holiness. Amen. So the two debtors, we, we have read our verse, uh, the truth we want to walk away with this morning, which I'm sure we all have an understanding, but hopefully we will have a deeper understanding that God forgives us our sins. Amen. I'm grateful for that. Amen. I will, and the truth for our lives uh, is that we can express our love for Jesus because he forgives our sins. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. Amen. So our lessons are set up also for a small group. And if you've ever been in a small group, you know oftentimes we do a, an icebreaker, uh, just a question that people want to answer. And this morning I thought we would we could uh, use the icebreaker even though it's not such a small group but uh you may not want to answer this out loud you may want to turn to someone near you and share this but uh give this a thought just for a moment what is your most prized possession i see some grins and some some people sharing and i i had i had I thought about, I have two boats, neither one of them which has a good motor, so I, I, if I had good boat motors, then I would, it'd probably be my boat, but if you want to, if you want to steal my boat, you have to take the motor with you, so, so that's not there on top of my list, but that, it would be otherwise, as far as possessions go, and remember, um, the old saying is that we, uh, uh, we, we love people and we use things okay so if you have a possession it's not a person it's a thing uh, amen all right so this morning i want to share a story with you about two lloyds and the whole time i was preparing for this i was thinking about how often i was going to stumble over the name lloyd because you have it's just a when you're in the middle of a sentence, Lloyd makes your tongue stop. Once an executive, one was an executive and one was a poor college student, as many college students are. While Lloyd, the executive, worked to better his organization, Lloyd, the college student, was working to pass finals. After a couple of starter jobs, the college student began working at the same organ organization as the executive. One day, Lloyd Shirley... The executive called on Lloyd, LJ, to help him with a computer issue. The executive called the student into his office for help with his computer. 
But while there, the student happened to see a little laptop called the libretto. Anybody ever have a libretto? Not even, okay. It was practically pocket size in the late 90s, and it made a MacBook look like a chalkboard. I guess everybody's got to get their dig at Apple on the way through. So, LJ remarked, this is the coolest laptop I have ever seen. But by now, Lloyd Shirley, the executive, had taken a liking to Lloyd Harry, the college student. And Brother Shirley asked him, would you like to have that? Would I like it, LJ thought. It's like asking if someone would like a cheeseburger after a seven-day fast. LJ loved the idea of having that laptop. His handwriting had begun to look like hieroglyphics, and uh, he felt sorry for the teachers who were going to have to read his writing. So if he could afford it, if he could have afforded a laptop, he would have bought one, but he obviously it was out of his price range. Being a full-time student and a part-time bank teller does not make for financial independence. Suddenly, Lloyd Shirley, the executive, gathered the libretto, the cord, and the drives and said, you can do some work for me to work this off. LJ was stunned. He fixed the computer issue that he had come to take care of and thanked the benevolent executive for his kindness and went back to his own desk. Right there on his own desk was his very own libretto laptop. Suddenly, the joy of what he had just been given was overshadowed by the weighty reality of how hard it was going to be to pay back the debt for this wonderful gift. It would take hours and hours outside of his school, his church, and his homework just to pay for it. But Brother Shirley was a very kind man. He never reminded L.J. what he owed him for the libretto. He just let the student use it all the way through college, and he certainly did. He typed up all his class notes all the way through his senior final. Then the beautiful spring day dawned when L.J. was ready to graduate. And right after graduation day, the two Lloyds met up again. And the college student, now a graduate realized he had never worked one hour to pay back uh, Lloyd for the libretto. That is the day that Brother Shirley reminded him. But he said with a smile, remember that laptop? Go, LJ thought. Uh, it's too late to work it off now. I'm leaving for Florida tomorrow. But before he could worry any more than that, Brother Shirley spoke again, and he said, it's all yours. The executive forgave Lloyd, the student, of his debt. To this day, they're still friends, and L.J. is still thankful for Brother Shirley's kindness in giving him a laptop that got him through college and then forgiving him of the debt that he owed. I want to talk about Jesus and how he taught in parables. Once he hung up his carpenter's apron, he began a ministry of teaching those around him about the kingdom of God. Jesus chose to teach many of his lessons as stories or parables. Stories about people or things that most of his hearers would understand. They were like lenses that Jesus gave to them so that they could see more clearly the glory of the kingdom of God. He shared one such parable with a holy man whose name was Simon. I want to talk about the story of the woman with the alabaster box. As the setting sun tossed long shadows on the street, Simon came bursting through the door of his house. His servants had seen that look before. That look meant extra work for them. Another man followed him into the room, and he was followed by a crowd that was following him. The servants scurried back into the kitchen and started dipping out more soup for all of these new guests. See, Simon was a Pharisee. He was a holy man in Israel who kept the law to its fullest extent. He was very careful to dot every I and cross every T. He was especially curious about this man, Jesus, who was a Nazarene and had just raised a widow's dead son back to life. 
Simon had been taught that only God can do those kind of miracles. How could Jesus do such a thing? Simon wanted to know if everything that everyone else was saying about Jesus was true. Was he truly the Messiah? Or was he just another man trying to be like God? While they sipped their soup and talked, another guest came into the building. She quietly wound her way through the crowd and stopped at Jesus' feet. Tears were flowing from her eyes. Simon's servants began to look at each other and wondered which of them would have to be the one to remove her from the house. As she wept, her tears fell on the feet of Jesus. Washing off some of the dust from the city streets, she knelt down then and let her long, dark hair uh, cover his feet, and she began to wipe her tears with her own hair. She cracked open then a beautiful alabaster box. She poured the sweet perfume on Jesus' feet. This worshiping woman kept weeping and pouring out the perfume and kissing Jesus' feet. And the whole time she whispered not a word, but her worship shouted her love for the Jesus that had forgiven her and her thankfulness for what he had done. She knew she had been forgiven, but everyone else only saw a notorious sinner. An uncomfortable hush fell on the room as everyone heard only the soft weeping of this apparently wicked woman. Simon, the Pharisee, was appalled. He wanted to stand and yell, Sinner! But he just sat there and pulled his religious robes tightly to his chest. There was no way this Jesus could be a prophet. Or he would have known that this filthy and unworthy woman uh, wasn't in the place where she should be. Simon began devising a way to toss Jesus out and this wicked woman with him. But Jesus did know what the woman had done. He knew that she had found forgiveness before God, and he knew exactly what Simon was thinking. Of course, Jesus, he really was a prophet, and so much more than a prophet. But Simon's prejudice and judgmental attitude prevented him from understanding any of this. His spiritual sight was blinded by his own self-righteousness. Finally, Jesus broke the uncomfortable silence and shared this parable. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one, 50 pieces of silver to another. But when it came time to pay their creditor back, neither one of them could pay the creditor uh, what he deserved. Unpaid debt carried the threat of being placed in the debtor's prison, slaving away for the masters that they knew, uh, that they neither knew nor loved until they had paid back the last denarius. They knew they were helpless to help themselves, but something wonderful happened at that moment. Their creditor freely forgave them both and canceled their debts. It did not even matter what the difference was in the amounts that they owed. They were both free to go. Their debts were forgiven. This was too good to be true. When he finished the parable, Jesus looked into Simon's face and asked him, Now, Simon, which of these debtors do you think loved the creditor more after that? Simon was a pretty smart guy. And Jesus was good at asking questions to which he already knew the answer. Simon swallowed hard and answered weakly, Well, I suppose... It was the one whose larger debt was forgiven. Now, when I read this parable again in preparation for this lesson, I began to wonder, at what point did Simon catch on? At what point did he see where Jesus was going with this story? Was it when he thought about the difference in the debts that were owed by these two men? Or was his vision so limited that he didn't get it until Jesus made the application to his situation. How much of God's word do we apply to ourselves when we hear it? 
How often do we think of the debt that we owe and the value of God's forgiveness? Or are we applying it to someone else? How often do we remember the cost of that forgiveness, the price that Jesus paid? Jesus smiled. Simon relaxed a little, and Jesus said, You're right, Simon, the one who was forgiven much. Then Jesus looked at the weeping woman who was still pouring perfume on him and kissing his feet. Jesus then asked Simon, You see this woman? When I came into your house this afternoon, my feet were dirty and dusty from walking in the streets. But you rushed me past the basin and towel and into the dining room. You motioned for me to sit down as you announced who I am and why I'm here, but you never once offered to wash the dust off my feet. But look at this woman. She's flooded my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. And Simon, you didn't greet me with a kiss, which is the normal standard of hospitality. But since she came in here, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You didn't even offer to anoint my head with oil. But she broke an alabaster box. More beautiful and expensive with expensive perfume. And she poured the perfume all over my feet. The room was silent as Jesus paused. Seemed like hours. You're right about one thing. She is a sinner, but she's been forgiven. In his own mind, Simon was not wicked, but he was not as thankful as this woman. Perhaps our testimony is like Simon's. Maybe we've been blessed to be a part of a godly family all our lives. Maybe our testimony is that God has kept us from the scars that others have. And he does not need to heal us from things that they need healing from. If so, we should really be thankful because we've been abundantly blessed. Thankfully, God loves and forgives sinners like Simon and sinners like us. Thankfully, we can show God our gratitude for his forgiveness through our worship. You have to wonder what it is that made Simon focus more on her sin than his own. But what if our story is more like her story? What if we have a past that we're not proud of and can't erase? What if it there was a time in our life when we found it hard to get up in the morning because of the weight of guilt and shame. But along came Jesus. He forgave us of our sins, all of our sins. If this is our story, we should be abundantly thankful because we too are abundantly blessed. That's why we should follow the lead of this repentant woman and fall at the feet of Jesus in extravagant worship. So what does that mean, extravagant worship? Extravagant worship for me or for you? What does that mean today? It's probably a little different for each one of us, but he's just as worthy. Jesus answered Simon's question before Simon had a chance to even ask it. He said, that's why she has shown me such love, Simon. A person who has been forgiven a little only loves a little, according to Luke 7. This act of worship was an act of love. Washing Jesus' feet with her tears, drying them with her hair, anointing his feet with precious perfume, and even kissing his feet were all ways of showing Jesus how much she loved him, how thankful she was. Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Praise God. Peace. We used to sing that song. Peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from above. Praise God. Sweep over my soul. Imagine how it flooded her soul. Peace. She may have forgotten what it felt like for so long relying on others submitting to the treatment of guilty, secretive men, fearful of violent treatment at their hands and 
the treatment that she received in her community peace it had been years since she really felt it but just hearing Jesus speak the word changed everything Simon saw a sinner but Jesus saw repentance and forgiveness this stirred up a firestorm among Simon's religious colleagues they nearly choked no one could forgive sins especially this kind of sin no one but God how dare he make himself equal with God this is blasphemy while they steamed over their theology they forgot one simple theological truth all have sinned and come short of God's goodness and holiness Romans 3 23 says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God all of us even the best of us have sinned according to 1 John we all sin Christian and non-Christian alike it's not a license to sin but it is a sobering reminder that we have no right to be self-righteous without the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ we're no better than the worst sinner that we can imagine <laughs> it's funny how we we quantify things but all of our sins need to be nailed to the cross where Jesus died the human consequences of sin may be different but only the righteous sacrifice of Jesus can take care of the eternal consequences of sin it's the same repentance it's the same forgiveness before and after we're born again some sin seems to be harmless a husband clicks where he ought not to while on a business trip a student takes a little pill to take the edge off we shout a few unkind unclean words in traffic we may think God does not care about those things and certainly our society doesn't our society even divides crime into two categories misdemeanor and felony I grew up with that concept of two categories of sin by the way but what about God what does he think about it does God care about a little lie like he does first degree murder does he see all sin the same remember both debtors needed forgiveness both were in danger of going to jail both were forgiven the consequences in the courtroom may be different but the consequences in our souls and our eternity are not all have sinned and sin separates us from God all our sins need to be nailed to the cross with Jesus Christ whether we are Simon or this woman before she became a worshiper we all need to repent we all need to get right with God it is by being born again and re regenerated by the transforming work of the Holy Spirit that we can enter into an eternal covenant with the living God this is our only hope for forgiveness when we realize how much we've been forgiven it will show up in how we worship Jesus and love him I want to say that again when we realize how much we have been forgiven it will show up in how we worship Jesus and how we love him when we realize the depth of the pit from which we were dug it will show the depth of our devotion to him praise God sometimes our worship calls us to jump for joy in red hot Sunday services other times that worship calls us to bury our faces in the carpet at the altar and weep when we realize just how merciful God is and how sinful we've been praise God the good news is that God still forgives this was music to this woman's ears and it should be music to our ears as well if you have wrecked your life and others God still wants to forgive you doesn't matter how far or how deep or how great your sin is he will freely forgive us if we will repent he is just the John said he's just and faithful to forgive us our sins if we will confess our sins 
and he was writing to Christians when he wrote that we don't need to beg God because God is waiting to forgive us and free us from our guilt that's one of the re main reasons he came from heaven to earth to give us life on Calvary to freely forgive in the book of John it says that he didn't come to judge the world because the world was condemned already if we could ask this woman from Luke 7 she would tell us worship is the only right response to Jesus for the forgiveness that he has shown us praise God I feel something here this morning I just want us to take a moment and examine ourselves and maybe if some of us have forgotten what it was like to feel that peace that comes when we know that our sins are forgiven maybe some of us have forgotten what it means to truly repent it means to I heard on talk radio someone talking about give a definition of repentance and he said it's to change uh, your mind to change your direction now if somebody on talk radio has that much understanding that's the very least that we should have as children of God amen and this is something that has to happen every day because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God it's been over 20 years since LJ walked into Brother Shirley's office to work on his computer. And Brother Shirley gave him that libretto. LJ used it all the way through college and a few years after. But as time passed, it grew more difficult to find parts for it. And unfortunately, it ran on Windows 95. That's a few operating systems ago. But that laptop is still valuable to LJ. Not because it helped him take class notes, because it, but because it reminds him of the undeserved kindness that Brother Shirley showed him when he was a needy college student. To this day, he keeps that libretto as a reminder of someone who loved him and showed him grace. Praise God. The Bible says that we should not forget the pit we were digged from. Amen. Now, some of us weren't in such a deep pit, but some of us were up to here in the mud. So, and We should remember the same. Jesus has given us all the greatest gift that anyone could ever receive. He's given us forgiveness and eternal life. An hour on Sunday to sing a few songs and listen to a sermon does not even seem sufficient. We can show the depth of our gratitude, however, through our worship to God. When we worship greatly, we remember that we have been forgiven much. When we worship little, maybe that means we've forgotten how much we've been forgiven. But we've been forgiven of much more and given much more than we even truly realize. Hopefully the parable of the two debtors and the stark contrast between self-righteous Simon and the worshiping woman remind us that we've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. But he's willing to forgive all of our sin and that we can live all of our lives to love and worship Jesus Christ. Praise God. Let us give God our wholehearted worship and thanks for all he has done for us. Let's live our lives to love the one who gave his life to love us and to love one another. Praise God. Please stand. We are early, early. I should get a... a two stars in your book for that <clears throat> praise God everyone say God is good say all the time praise God let's lift our hands and worship him just for a moment thank you Jesus thank you Jesus thank you God 
Thank you, God, for the blood of Calvary. Thank you, Jesus, for the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for never leaving us and never forsaking us. Thank you, God, for first loving us so that we can know how to love you. We worship you. We praise you, God. We thank you for it. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Let's continue to seek forgiveness for our sin of course our effort is to not to sin anymore that's the first uh, goal but when we do sin the bible says that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin for god to help us and let's also continue to pray for god to help us to worship him as he deserves with a thankful heart for all that he has done everyone said in jesus name amen we have a baby dedication service this morning we're looking forward to that and uh, if you do have children in the Sunday school uh, wait a few minutes before you go pick them up otherwise you'll you'll have to go stand there and wait in line anyway because they probably won't be getting out for another five or ten minutes but uh, please make sure that you uh, remember uh, when the time comes to go pick up your children greet someone in the name of Jesus especially welcome those families that have children here that are going to be dedicated and uh, and let's worship the Lord like he deserves when we come back again uh, at 11 o'clock God bless you in Jesus name
and find no one like you I believe you have a power to make this life brand new Troubles come and you are there to heal my broken heart There is nothing in this world that could tear us apart It doesn't matter what the world says We will live for you For everything and on your word we will stand Take control over all of me My life is in your hands It doesn't matter what the world says It doesn't matter what the world says We will live for you
Growing up as a kid through school, I had a problem with just one teacher, and that was my English teacher. Because on the first day of school, he came in and presented a philosophy to the class. And he said that there is no such thing as one word answers. He said, I don't want any one word answers on any homework. He said, because in life, you're going to face very difficult problems, very complex problems, and a one word answer will not be sufficient. And in a way, he was correct, because in today's world, we all know we have big problems, complex problems, big issues we never thought we would have to face. We find author upon author writing book upon book and writer upon writer writing article upon article and trying to describe the answer to the complex problems. But tonight, I just want to refute the philosophy of my English teacher and say that there is a one-word answer to every problem in our world, and that is Jesus Christ. The answer to the sin problem is Jesus. The answer to the addiction problem is Jesus. The answer to every problem you're going to face is the name of Jesus. The answer is Jesus.
to this morning. God is calling us to come to him in spite of it not making sense. We have nowhere else to go. We can always, always come to him.
God's been good in your life, let's give him a hand today. Let's thank him for who he is. Thank you, God, for your goodness. Thank you, God, for what you've done in our lives. Thank you, God, for the good, God, for being there in the bad, God. Thank you so much. Hallelujah. God is so good. You could be seated this morning. Today is a special day, one of my favorite days here at Calvary Gospel Church. It is Baby Dedication Sunday. If this is your first time here, or maybe you've been a part of one of these because you have a family member who's had multiple kids, uh, welcome back. Uh, if this is your first time here, welcome. We do this twice a year where we dedicate our children to the Lord, and we'll go into that in a little bit. But we're so glad you're here. If you're a visitor and you want to get to know a little bit more about us, or you don't mind if we ask you a few questions, we have a little card in the back. If you could fill that out, very simple, name, phone number. I promise we're not going to call you about your car warranty expiring. Okay, that's not us. That's somebody else. Um, but a couple announcements before we get rolling into things is, uh, first off, for uh, next Sunday, the 12th, we have a new round of New Life classes starting. So New Life classes, uh, some of you have been through this before, but it's a way to kind of, I would say, kickstart. You start to get to know God. Maybe you're coming to church. You're like, I want to know a little bit more. I don't know where to start. This is a great place to start. It's a 101 level, 201 level, 301, about eight weeks roughly each time. And it, great teachers, great content. If you want to learn a little bit more about God and his word and teach you how to learn more about God and his word, I would highly recommend the new life classes that are starting next week. Also next Sunday on March 12th, we have a ladies event from four to six. Yes, we could be excited. It's okay. They're going, they're going to an escape room uh, as a group. The cost is $36 a person. Uh, Sister Lindsay, I see you over there. Can you wave your hand? Over, maybe stand up so people see your hand. The Sister Lindsay, you can find her, and uh, she, you could, she'll take your money and make sure you're signed up for the escape room. So it's going to be, that's the monthly event for March, as a reminder, for all these groups. If you go onto the app, you can find when their events are, if you click on events. So, And then the last, the last thing I had before we roll into this, also, the, we don't, we're not going to be passing anything for giving, but people that are interested, we do have a box in the backs to give to. We, we're, we're fully 2023. You can give online. You can give by mail. You can give in the, there's an app as well, but... Either way, this, we just want to make sure those options are available. So baby dedication. How this works today. Let me give you a quick overview if this is your first time or maybe you don't remember how we've done this before. Well, we're going to introduce all the families. So you're going to get a chance to, to meet the children and the parents. Okay, we're going to do that right away. Then we're going to have the dedication. We're going to take a time where, just so you're not surprised, if you're a member of the family, we we're going to ask the whole church to stand. And we're going to ask you to come up and stand with your family as a, as a show of support. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to take the mic or sing or anything. Just stand by your family and show of support. And then Pastor Roy is going to be giving a message. And today it's always geared towards parents and, and children in the baby dedication theme. But also, I have, I have said for years now, since we've been doing this, that I believe that God's word is powerful. And I believe that there's a lesson for me in this, whether I have a child or not, or whether I have an infant or not, or whether I'm dedicating or not. So I would encourage you to, to listen to see what God has for you in this service today. So before we start, I, I think there's something we, we like to clarify beforehand is we have a baby dedication service today. It has been asked, you know, hey, where's, where's the baptismal service? Why don't you baptize your children at Calvary Gospel Church? And what I would say is at Calvary Gospel Church, we dedicate our children to the Lord. We do not baptize them. This is a sign that we are putting them in God's hands. Much like Hannah in the, st in the story of Samuel in the Old Testament, when she physically gave her son Samuel to the priest to work in the temple, uh, once she had weaned him. Today, we symbolically put our kids in God's hands. Don't send them to come work at the church just yet. You know, they're just infants at this time. We symbolically put them in God's hand and know that he is able, just like in 1 Timothy, that he is able to keep and take care of whatever we commit to him. Which applies to more than just children, right? Anything we put in God's hands, God can take care of, right? Marriages, finances, struggles at work, you name it. In the Bible, we see where baptism, every time we talk about baptism, which is being fully submersed underwater, it requires understanding, repentance, and belief. As an infant cannot do these things, we do not baptize infants. Furthermore, just baptizing something without them understanding or believing or having repented is, is not accomplishing the purpose of it. And so today, our focus is on dedicating the child, committing the child to God, but more importantly, is committing our lives as parents Right, parents? Committing to say, we want to raise this child in the ways of God. And you as family members saying, I want to be a part of helping this child to grow and be a, be a good member of society. So 
With that said, we're going we're gonna to introduce some of the children's here. Pastor Roy is going to hand out, we have a Bible for you. It's a really great Bible. You can start reading it whenever with your children. A little picture Bible and a certificate and a onesie. There's a onesie. So the first, uh, pa- the first parents uh, we would like to have stand is James and Rachel, Rachel Novak. They're, they're dedicating Elena and Novak. These pictures are always so cute. It's hard to choose just one, isn't it, when you do this? There's like, there's thousands of these pictures now. The next family is Phil and Brittany Stackhouse and their daughter, Julia Stackhouse. So beautiful. She's looking like her brother, too. I can see it. And then the last family is Michael and Sarah Tesh, dedicating Lydia Tesh. I know these poses are not easy. Trying to get them up there, propped up, smiling. Very well done there, Tesh family. It's apparently an all all girl baby dedication today so that's exciting so what I'd like to do is I'd like to have the the mom and dad we're going to have you stand and bring your child to the front with your with your minister that's that's with you if you could come to the front and we're going to start with just that everybody can stay seated we have a little bit of a charge for you as well as uh, I'm going to ask you some questions and when I ask you you could say we do if you if it's your intent that you will try to follow those things so for now you can hold on to your child and when we pray you can hand your child over to the to the minister okay and then at the end church remember i said all of you in the sanctuary we all have a part in this too right we're all a part of this community of this family and so we have a little bit of a commitment as well so moms and dads let me talk to you first dedication is a time for parents to commit their child back to jesus realizing we are only stewards of his blessings in our lives We are not committing them to God to raise them. Rather, we are committing that we as parents will raise our children in the ways of Christ. That we will dedicate our lives to following the ways of God and his word and training our children to do the same. To all the parents and family members and friends gathered here today, let this child be a reminder that we are always in much need of God's grace, God's love, and his presence. When this child runs into your arms and wants you to carry them, let it be a reminder that we can run into the arms of Jesus where we will be surrounded by his presence and his love and his grace. Dads, let me talk to you for a minute. The relationship between a father and his child is very special. Be a leader and a guide to them, not through dictatorship, but through setting an example and serving them. Never let your responsibilities as a man get in the way of your God-given mandate of being a father. This all starts with your own relationship with your Heavenly Father. It is only out of this relationship we can truly live out what God has intended us as a man, husband, and father. Mothers, God has designed you uniquely to be the caregiver for your children, to nourish and comfort them. They will come to you when they are in need, and they will come to you when they are not in need. The love a mother can show to her children is incomparable. Never let your caregiving get in the way of your own relationship with your Heavenly Father. It is through your relationship with your Heavenly Father that you can live out the life God has for you as a woman, spouse, and mother. Parents, you're the example your children see more than any other. You create the normal that will begin to shape who they are and what they believe. Set that example in your marriage in your responsibilities, and in your walk with God. Show them how to learn, how to grow, how to succeed, and how to fail. Show them how to live life God's way. So we're going to ask you some questions. Hey, we're used to this. Babies cry. It's a totally okay thing. Don't worry about it. They're going to figure it out. We're going to figure it out. So I'm going to ask you questions. You could say we do. Uh, She's already saying yes. I I can hear it. So parents, do you now present your child before God with the purpose of dedicating your child to the Lord? You could say we do. Okay. Minister, do you consecrate yourselves, uh, sorry, 
parents, you consecrate yourselves as parents to raise up your child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Parents, do you promise to instruct this child in the teachings of Jesus Christ and in the practice of prayer and to guide them in the development of Christ-like character? It's a long one. Do you promise to try the best of your ability to shape the home life of this child, both by family devotion and by your words and your example, that they themselves will grow in personal relationship with Jesus and will pursue the biblical experience of salvation through repentance, baptism, and the infilling of the Holy Spirit? Church family, everybody out here, will you please stand with us this morning? If you accept this charge, you could say, We will. Will you do all that you can to provide and support a place of instruction and community where this child and these parents may hear godly wisdom? Will you covenant together as a family, a community, to set an example by your lives and to maintain an atmosphere which will inspire these children to desire to live for God? Will you do as God leads you and pray for these families? So if you have, if you're a family member here to support your your this couple and their child getting dedicated, could you gather around near them, kind of fan out around them near the front? We're gonna say a prayer for this child, for these parents, for you as a family and friends, and for this congregation that God would assist us in this in this process, that God would bless this child. If it, if it feels right to you and you'd like to kind of reach forward and, and touch the person in front of you and as a sign of support, you, you're welcome to do that. Otherwise, you can stand as well where you're at. Uh, parents, if you would like to, as, to, to show a sign of giving your child to the Lord, could you hand your child to the minister as we begin this prayer? So awesome. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you today. God, on this special day, God, with these parents, Lord, that are dedicating these children to you, God. You know their hearts. You know their intents, Lord. God, I pray, Lord, this morning first for this child. God, I pray that you would protect this child, that you would bless this child. God, that your anointing would be on this child, God. Lord, I pray that, Lord, as it lives in this family, with this home, with these parents, God, that you would be with this child, that you would help it, God. Let your spirit speak into its heart and mind, God. God, let it know your love and your grace, Lord, as it grows. God, we pray for these parents. God, I pray, Lord, as they undertake this task, whether it's the first or second or third child, God, Lord, that you would give them the grace and mercy and compassion that they need. God, give them the wisdom and patience, God, Lord, to take on this task. God, Lord, give them the boldness and the courage, Lord, to set, Lord, your word and the things that you have commanded, Lord, to be first in their home. Help them to put you first in their lives, in their marriage, and in their home, God, so that their children can be benefited and their children can go. God, we pray for the family and friends that have come here to support them. God, we pray that you would encourage them. God, speak into their house, house, hearts. Let them feel your grace and your love this morning. God, and we pray for this community, God, this church as a whole. God, I pray that you would continue to work in our hearts to be a community that loves you, to be a community that follows you, God, a community that wants to know you more, God, and feel your goodness and see your goodness in our life. God, I pray, Lord, that you would continue to let us be an example to families in this church and in this community. And God, we do this, we ask this all in your name, in Jesus' name, amen. And as much as you have promised before God and this people to dedicate your child to God and to yourselves, to the task of raising them for Christ, we charge you this morning to faithfully to address yourself faithfully to the sacred obligation with wisdom, patience, and devotion. May God bless you in all your efforts. You can find your way back to your seat this morning. It's, yeah, it's normal. John said, and now she stopped crying. I've been here four times. Some of them were great. Some of them cried. It's just, it's what it is. You can't pick the timing of the child, right? They, sometimes they need to eat or get changed. It's just, it's just life. That's part of who it is. So you could be seated this morning. Uh, I'm so excited this, every year Pastor Roy and I talk like, okay, we got a couple baby dedications and, 
And uh, this year we really wanted Pastor Roy to speak, and he felt really God gave him something for this morning. So can we give Pastor Roy a hand as he gives a, a message for us this morning? Is the Lord Church. It is so great to be here today, and it's so awesome to have the families, the Novaks and the Stackhouses and the Teshes, all of your families. It's so great to see some of you. Some of you, it's been a while. It's been weddings since I've last seen you, but uh, so great to be here, and thank you so much for being part of this uh, today. Um, it's great to have Brother and Sister Chess on here, and uh, they... Uh, if I understand this right, when uh, Rachel was a baby, they dedicated Rachel, and uh, here she is having her children dedicated, and they being part of this. I think that's awful to have a powerful voice for this many years in in their lives, and thank you so very much for being here today. It's great to have Bishop here. We're excited. So good to see him, and that's good to see... Uh, my brother Johnny over there that uh, so he's uh, recovering from open heart surgery so uh, there is a toilet bro that's plugged I just wanted to let you know on your way out he oversees our maintenance here so I'm just going to throw a little bit of a plug in there I just want to speak for just a few minutes this morning this will not be a lengthy message so uh, if you have dinner plans by 2 o'clock, you'll be easily out of here by then. But uh, it's a short passage. It's found in Luke chapter 2, verse 52. And it says, Jesus grew in wisdom and statue and in the favor with God and men. I personally, I want to be able to grow in wisdom and statue, and I would like to have the favor of both God and man. And I think that's something that we should all strive for. And uh, so we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit today about some things are best learned from family. Some things are best learned from family. Awesome families encourage growth in their children. I've been in uh, I've been to this church since 1972, and uh, I've been in uh, the uh, Apostolic Pentecostal denomination or faith my entire life. I don't know anything other than this. I've seen a lot of families come and go. I've seen a lot of families grow up. I've been around a lot of folks over the years, and I've seen some families that are very powerful, strong, influential families, and I've seen some families that just always seemingly are struggling. And uh, I, I, I wonder sometimes families that, that encourage growth in their children, typically the moms and dads are growing as, as, as parents. And it's important. Today, we're, we're, I'm really not talking to, to, to Elena and Julia and Lydia this morning. I'm talking to the moms and the dads and the aunts and the uncles the grandmas and the grandpas. I'm talking to family and friends because you see, it, it, it's all part of the family that encourage growth. I've had members in, in my own family. I've had uncles that have had tremendous influence in, in my life along with my, my parents. And uh, I've had aunts that have had influence and cousins that have had influence. So we go through life. We don't go through life solo as an island. God has placed us in family units for a purpose. There's a reason behind all of this because in most families, there's, there's strength in a family. There's, a, there's a encouragement in a family. Uh, there's, there's power in a family. You're not fighting some of these battles by yourself. That's why God gave you a mom and a dad. When you're, uh, oh, I don't know, up until some of us up until 30, we let mom and dad fight our battles. Uh, some of us, we at five years old, we declare ourselves independent. I don't need mom and dad anymore. We pack our bags and we hit to the, we go to the street corner and and we're we're gonna find a, a, another a better life uh, because mom and dad is mean. So so we 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 have all different kinds, 
But some families, awesome families, encourage growth. And how do they do this? How does one family encourage growth and another family seem to always struggle in this area? Well, it's because the awesome families that encourage growth, they create an atmosphere of not just learning on a temporal basis, but a lifelong learning. They instill it in you that, son, I remember my dad, son, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching you these things for a lifetime, not just for today, not just so you know how to do this today, but so you can do this when I'm no longer here, when you're out on your own and you're, you're making your own way through life. So, so awesome families encourage growth by creating an atmosphere of lifelong learning. They help each other develop and uh, they encourage the discovery of each other's person's spiritual gifts as well as, as talents and abilities. And they allow people, they allow their children to learn new things and develop new interests. As I was a kid, I had so many different things I liked to do. I loved art. We, we grew up, we never had a TV in our home. Um, it's not that uh, probably we couldn't afford one, but I think that dad just felt like that, you know what, I'd rather my, my boys be able to take and learn skills and have, have hobbies and, and be outdoors and, and not sit there for hours on end watching TV. So, so we didn't have a TV in the home. But boy, did we have a lot of fun as kids growing up. There were times in my life we have children that struggle with identity today, and I'm not making fun of that, but there were times in my life that, that I was Daniel Boone for weeks on end. I would go out, and I would come home from school, and I would be reading in my my history book or been reading about Davy Crockett or, or, or some of these uh, uh, old pioneers, Kit Carson, the mountain man. I could just imagine myself with a, looking like Rick Wells <laughs> with a big beard and a buckskin and having a horse and, 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 and eating and living off the land. My parents encouraged us to develop new things and new interests. You didn't necessarily, you don't need necessarily a biological family to help you grow. Your church family, God has placed us within, Pastor Peter talked about that as a, a challenge to the church. We are all here to help your children grow. Some things you're never going to learn if you don't learn them in relationship with others. I learned how to get beat up by my brother. We're not going to go into that this morning. He's just recovering from a heart surgery, and I don't want to take and cause any undue stress on his life. But some things you can't learn you can't learn at school. You can't learn them at work. You can only learn them with relationship with other people. Whether we like it or not, whether we want to admit it or not, but we need community. We need each other. In fact, most of your problems as an adult will more than likely come from the fact that you didn't learn certain things correctly as a child. Now we can go into, we could get into, this is a whole message within itself. But as a kid, as a young adult, I learned a lot of things on the school bus. And uh, things were not always, I didn't always have the best of teachers on the school bus, nor the best of advice on the school bus. And none of it was godly. So today we're going to cover just what I would say are a few simple life lessons that are best learned as in a family. So some things best learned from family is you learn what to do with your feelings. <laughs> oh boy, I love this. I'm just going to tell you this morning, I'm old school. Okay, I grew up in a whole different century than most of the kids today. 
I'm 60 years old. Some of you are older than I am, but I grew up in, in, the, in the 1960s and 70s. The 1900s. We had yet to have answering machines and we had rotary telephones that you would pick up and dial. And if you listened and you understood how that worked, it, it's fascinating that sparks can cause numbers to, uh, you can connect to other people. We had, we, we, we had, we didn't have call waiting. We didn't have caller ID. VCRs were not yet invented. Nobody even understood what a computer could do, let alone the personal value of it. Gas was 19 cents a gallon. That's when I grew up. We ate crayons and survived. That's when I grew up. I was told that the more purple you eat, the purpler you'll become, and I am yet to hit purple. So some things are best learned from family. You learn what to do with feelings. In a healthy family, you learn how to identify. You, need, you, you learn how to own up to, and you learn how to express your feelings. Now, my brothers and I, we, there was three of us, and uh, we were pretty good at this. And uh, we learned how to express our feelings towards one another. And, 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 and each one of my brothers knew how I felt about them at certain times. And uh, I was not afraid to voice my opinion to my brothers. I did have a deep, a different respect for my, my father, on the other hand, though. I remember one time when I was, I think I was 16, I got a little lippy out in the driveway, and the lippiness went into the garage. And I remember, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't go there. But my father was not afraid of sparing the rod, spoiling the child, even at 16. And uh, I remember my dad telling me a story when on his wedding, the morning he was getting married, his mom knocked him off the back porch with a mop because he lipped off to her. Is that correct, Bishop? Yeah, he's reluctantly nodding. I didn't get knocked off the back porch with the mop, but I found out what, how fast my father really was and what his old age at probably 40. You see, I, 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 I learned how to deal with feelings and emotions. And awesome families should let everyone be honest and let kids express how they feel too. Now, there's a difference between lipping off and voicing your opinion. We need to learn how. How do we express our opinion? And this is where awesome families teach and train their children how to properly express your feelings. Typically, if you're a smart aleck as a kid, you're a smart aleck as an adult. You're one of those some things are best learned from family. You learn how to handle conflict. Wow. We live in a world today where so many people don't know how to deal with conflict. If you disagree with someone, you hate me. I can't, we, we live in a world today where that, that if, if, if you disagree with me, then I don't like you. I will shun you, I will ghost you, I will do all of these, I will, I will do whatever I can do to make life miserable for you. That's where we live in. Some things are best learned from family and how to deal and how to handle conflict. You know why kids today can't deal with and handle conflict? Because parents can't deal with and handle conflict. It gets passed down from generation to... This is, we are suffering today from generational curses. Where that every generation, it, it, gets, it gets a little bit more laxed and a little more laxed and a little more lax, and we let other people teach and train and raise our children. Listen, moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, aunts and uncles, cousins, teach your children how to handle conflict. You see, kids need to see their parents, 
not toe-to-toe fussing it out and arguing, but they need to see their parents resolving conflict. If your kids can't resolve conflict, it's because they're learning it from you. They learn it from you. If we as adults can't sit down at a table and solve our issues with our spouses or someone else in a healthy way and talk about our differences, listen, nobody in here is going to think, we, no one here thinks the same. We don't all think alike. We all have our own minds. We have our own thought processes. This is how God created us. It's awesome. There's not a world of seven billion clones. There's, there's a world of seven billion independent thinkers. That's how God designed us, but, but the world is making us all wanting us all to be clones. I don't want to be a clone. I want to be able to think for myself. I want to be able to handle conflict. I want to be able to resolve conflict. Some things best learned from family is you learn how to handle loss. Years ago, my wife and I, we were visiting a, some friends, some family, and uh, they asked us if we wanted to play a game. And uh, I, I like to play games, not as much anymore. I know we have some gamers here that meet on Sundays and such. I, it's one of those things, as a growing up, I love to play games. and. And um, But we were starting to play this game, and before we started the game, the mother let us know right away that we don't play to win. We're playing sorry. How many of you ever played sorry? Got the little bubble that you, or trouble. Is that trouble? Yeah, the little bubble that you push and the, the dice pops up, that's trouble. Is that right? Okay, might have got them mixed up. Anyway, it wasn't shoots and ladders. But uh, I know what that one is. So we're playing, I think it was Trouble, actually, where you push the little button and the little dice pops and you move around. And they're telling us right away that there are no winners and losers. And I'm like, well, what do you want to play the game for? What's the point in the game? Why do we need to? But we went along with it. And uh, there were no winners and no, no losers, even though there actually was someone that came in first. And there was someone that lost, but we all celebrated because we were all winners. We were all happy. Let's all celebrate that we all won at trouble. Well, the problem is, is life isn't that way. You'd like to think it is in a perfect utopia in your own mind that we could all just be winners, but that's not that way. You see, growing up, I did not want my daughter to win all the time. You see, my father didn't let us win all the time. When we played a game or we were arm wrestling, I've never beat my father in arm wrestling. I haven't arm wrestled him lately, only because I'm afraid I still might lose. But nevertheless, my father never, just for the sake of being dead, let us win. Because there are in life winners and there are losers. And I did not want my daughter to win all the time. Unfortunately, the sting of defeat sometimes helps make you a better person. It pushes you just a little bit more to be able to feel that I didn't get first place. Now all you got to do is show up and you get a trophy. I told you I was born in a different century, a different millennia. We didn't get trophies if we didn't win first place, Brother Rico. And if you didn't win first place, you didn't deserve to win first place. Whoever put the effort in to get there first deserved to win the trophy. You might have got a follow-up, or there might have been something for second and third place. But you see, if you don't want to teach your kids to win if you want to teach your, or your kids to if your kids are in a habit of winning all the time you're going to find it that it's going to be devastating when they face inevitable losses in a real adult world they need to learn that failure won't destroy them 
It's not the end of their life or the end of their world if they get a B in biology. You use that moment to teach them that failure won't destroy them and that a loss isn't the end of the world. I remember a young man that came to our church a number of years ago that he was contemplating suicide. That's how he ended up in church. And when I asked him, he was asked, why, why did you get to this point in life? It's because he received his first B ever in college. He was a college student at the UW. I was thinking about that when I heard that story, and I'm like, good Lord, I would have loved to have had a B. I was familiar with C's and D's. I did get some A's at history, biology. I loved biology. I loved history. I didn't like English. Didn't care for it much. Didn't see much of a point for algebra. I don't care what A squared times B squared equals. It doesn't matter to me any because I don't square A and I don't square B. What's the point? But I found out when I got into plumbing that I, I needed algebra. So I had to go back and I had to dig out some old ACE paces. And I had to relearn some of those things because now I see the value. Now I know what why, why A squared times B squared. I got, I got it now. But you see, a loss in life is not going to destroy you. It's not going to... Teach your children how to lose gracefully. Don't let them throw temper tantrums. Some adults, you lose, they throw temper tantrums. Accept the loss, grow from it, and move forward. Some things are best learned from family. You learn which values matter most. Well, we're going to get into a little bit of... Uh, something you're probably not expecting here today. You see, the important, it's important to teach kids the three most basic temptations that they're going to face in life. And uh, so that they're not going to be swayed by what the world values. I want to say this again, but I'm going to say it right now. If you don't instill values into your children, somebody else is going to. You understand that? If you don't instill values into your children, someone else is going to. So when we look at this, it's important to teach our children three basic temptations of life. And these temptations have to do with how you feel, what you do, and what you get in life. In other words, we need to teach our children about sex. Uh-oh, is he really going there? We need to teach our children about salary, and we need to teach our children about status. All right? Because I'm not going to get into the details in all of these, so don't panic. Um... It's your responsibility, parent, to teach your children about these things. And we don't always like to talk about these. But I promise you as a parent that these three points will be the biggest temptations your children will ever have to deal with in life. Do not avoid talking about them. If you don't approach these topics, trust me, they're going to learn them, and they're going to learn them from someone else that you don't necessarily want teaching them about that. One of the biggest reasons our kids are being fed such plain lies when it comes to these topics is because years ago, parents decided that it was better for them to learn it from someone else than me to have to teach them. So... We have generations of families of children that grew up and they have a skewed view of what sex really is 
and what it's intended for and the purpose behind it. We have kids that have a skewed view of salary, money, work, and a skewed view of status. And what does it mean to actually, we have, we have a generation of people that, that are striving to be relevant no matter what the cost. I want, I, w- I want to be relevant. I want, I want to be, it just, it just boggled me when Pastor Peter shared that statement with us about the Chinese children, the number one they thing they wanted to be was an astronaut when they were polled, an astronaut, because it's a huge thing in China if you're going to grow up and, 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 and be an astronaut. That's something that, that the Chinese children, that was number one on their list. Number one for American children on their list was social influencer. There's something wrong here. It didn't just break in this generation. It broke years ago, and we were never, we never got around, and we never, we never took the time to fix it. We have to fix this, folks. Not just as a family, as a church, as a community. So parents, decide... Parents decided it was better for their kids to learn about sex, salary, and status from other people. And they stopped teaching and training their children. Teach them your biblical values. Listen, if you do not instill or teach into them your value system, somebody else will instill theirs. That's why we have what we have today. Some things are best learned from family. You learn good habits from family. Good habits from family. Habits determine your character. You see, families should help each other grow so that everyone's character is not more like mom and dad's character. But we need to teach our children that your character needs to be like Jesus' character. Brother Seidel did a phenomenal job in an adult Bible class this morning talking about forgiveness. We need to teach our children to forgive. Why is there no forgiveness or very little tolerance and very little forgiveness in our world today? Because we're not teaching our children to forgive. We're teaching them to get even. It's all about me, folks. This is all about me today. That's what we teach our children. You've got to take, out for your, take care of yourself. Nobody else is going to take care of you. So basically, as a parent, you're now relinquishing. They're saying, it's not my responsibility to take care of you either. No. Teach your children. Teach your children good habits. This just sounds so silly, but you know how I learned to brush my teeth? My mom and dad taught me how to brush my teeth. That's a good habit to learn, by the way. Just throwing it out there. You know how I learned how to shave? Yep, my dad taught me. My brother John attempted to teach me, but I think he sabotaged me because I ended up with so many Band-Aids on my face that I, like, I'm not quite for sure that's how it's supposed to be done, but you know how I learned so many of these good habits that I have determined or I have, have in my life? is my parents taught them to me. I learned from my father. I learned from my mother. I learned from people like Bill and Carolyn Thorpe, from Aunt Jan Rager, from Ron Wittenbach. Some of these older saints that when I was growing up had, had influence in my life. That's why it's important as older saints, never give up. You're influencing people whether you realize it or not. So families should help each other grow so that everyone's character is more like Jesus Christ. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that we start making changes today. Today. So that your family, doesn't matter to me whether it's your biological family or we have a number of folks that have adopted children here at Calvary Gospel Church. It doesn't matter if, it's, if your children are adopted. It, it, it's irrelevant or, or, or spiritual. We need to make changes so that your family, so that this, your family, this church is a safe 
environment for everyone to learn and to grow. Because according to Luke chapter 2, <laughs> Jesus grew in wisdom and in statue. I want our children to grow in wisdom and in statue. And I want them to have favor with both God and with man. As a pastor, if I can get your children, if we can get your children to go in wisdom and statue and have favor with God and with man, then we've done our job. That's what our job as a parent is to do, to teach our children, to grow our children. Let's stand this morning. It's 12 noon right on the dot. And as we close out this baby dedication service, it is, once again, it's so great to have all of you here today and the families. But I always like to end, I don't just like ending messages and just saying, okay, here's the word and, you know, take what you can take. And But you see, some this was the awesome thing about Jesus is he always demanded some kind of a response or action. Now, I'm not Jesus today, but I'm preaching from his word. So I would say that if Jesus was here today, he would ask you this question. How can I create an atmosphere of learning within my family? What can I do? What can I do? How can, how can, I, how can I better teach my children as a grandparent? It's our grandparents that are here today. And, and uh, my challenge to you would be that as a grandparent, when your grandchildren come over, how I, I love just bringing my grandkids over and spoiling them rotten and sending them home, filling them full of pizza and Mountain Dew and saying, you know what? <laughs> but you see, also, I, there are times where that I've worked with my grandson. We're working on a project together, Brother Pete, and little guy. I mean, he it was it was quite. It was putting down a, a, a deck. He wanted to he wanted a loft in a, a, a play area. So I said, "Well, Poppy will help you build it, but you got to help me." And we had three and a half inch screws and hundreds and hundreds of them. And he started screwing those deck boards down, and he got about all the way to the end, but he had two deck boards left. He's like, Poppy, I'm just tired. I was tired too. I was like, man, this little guy's gonna kill me. But I wanted to teach us, I wanted to learn a lesson. Not a huge lesson, but just a valuable lesson. Sometimes when you're tired, you gotta finish what you start. That's the way it works. That's the way it works in on the job. I was a plumber. Well, there are times I'd love to just go home at 4 o'clock, but you know what? Some poor family wouldn't have any water, wouldn't have any toilets, wouldn't have anything all night long. So I decided sometimes you got to finish what you start. So I took that moment as a grandpa. You know what, Cole? 24 screws per board, 48 more screws, and we're done. And we can go swimming. Let's just get this done. All right. And you know what? We got it done. So how can I create an atmosphere of learning within my family? Why does it seem harder to teach children today how to handle loss in today's culture? Why is it harder? Ask yourself that question. Maybe it's because we as a parent, as a grandparent, have never learned how to handle loss. What are the values that matter most to me, dads? What a challenge you hear this morning. What values most? What matters most to you? What is it, you have all girls, what is it that you want to take and teach and instill into your daughters? What matters the most? And what are the biblical values that we want to teach our children? What is it that we... We have personal values. We have biblical values. What do we want to teach our children? As we ponder on these four questions, 
I'm going to ask our worship team to begin to sing. And I want to throw this out to everyone here. These questions. It's not just for our families on the front row today. It's for all of us. What do I want to be? What do I want to become? What do I want to be noted for? What do I want to instill in? So as we open up this altar area this morning, up front here, if you'd like to come forth together as a family, a husband, a couple, I'll leave that up to you. I know some of you have it's been long days for the children. After the service out in the vestibule, we have areas you can take your families and take pictures. But God bless you and thank you for coming. Let's pray. Beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Oh,
again thank you so very much to the Novak family, the extended family, for being here today and the stack houses. So great to have all of our family here today and, and the Teshes. And, uh, we love all, we love these families, appreciate them. And uh, God bless you all. And uh, God bless the grandmas and grandpas and the aunts and the uncles and the moms and the dads, the cousins. Thank you so very much for coming out today. Wednesday evening, we'll be back here for service. Brother Peter Sandin with our family ministries. I actually think Sister Jessica Rivest is, uh, has a lesson for us on Wednesday evening. Family ministry team. So God bless you. Have a very blessed week. Enjoy the beautiful, beautiful day we have today. And, uh, we'll see you back here. God bless.